Thank you. Okay. Yes. Um, obviously, the movement in, in electronics that makes Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley, that gives us iPhones, was a trend from the big, hot vacuum tubes. It was actually the, the first little adder I showed you. Use relays. Then we moved to vacuum tubes and the computers that were full of thousands of vacuum tubes. Then we moved into transistors that allowed the computers to be smaller and a little bit cleaner, cooler, faster. And of course we moved to today's chips. One of the big steps in my life was my first transistor radio. First time ever I held a gadget in my hand that I loved what it could do. It brought me music. It opened my world up. I could sleep with it and hear music all night long and uh, music's become such a big part of my life. And I looked at my little radio and it had six transistors in it. Hand built in Japan, but hand built. And um, my dad worked at Lockheed. The only people that could afford the early chips and really spur this chip industry was the military and the very largest corporations, their needs for computers. So so my dad had access to the companies in Silicon Valley that were about to make the first chips ever. And he took me to a show when I was maybe eight years old and, and I went there and I saw a gentleman presented a, a picture that showed little blocks and said, this is a picture that we're going to turn into a chip with six transistors on one chip, one piece of silicon. And I went home and I went to my dad and I said, wow, so they're going to make better transistor radios? And he said, no, 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 these chips cost way too much. Only the military can afford them. After a number of years, there's surplus that they don't need anymore and that's what people get. And I always felt darn, you know, the needs of real people for things in their home that bring them enjoyment should be pushing our industry. Well, what is pushing the state of the art of the silicon industry nowadays? Personal computers and now games. The highest, most powerful chips that are made on Earth are, are made for game machines. So the legacy of the little personal device has come true. Mm -hmm. All right, give me a couple seconds and we'll get around here. Okay. And I think next is homebrew. Um, kitchen computer, uh, transistor radio. Yeah, homebrew. Homebrew. Okay. So we're gonna walk this way. Pass a number of. This is all about the uh, semiconductor industry and machines that use microprocessors like the Commodore PET. Uh, the Channel F from Fairchild uh, with these, the first video game system to use carts. Uh, so, you know, 20 something years of ah, hitting people with a camera, um, 20 something years of cartridges uh, as video games started with the Fairchild Channel F. Uh, keep coming through, you can see. Very important, that's my old PlayStation. Just like to point that out. Donate for a good time. This is a section on artificial intelligence and robotics. And that guy right there, the blue one, is Officer Mack. He was used by the Sunnyvale Police Department to actually teach kids about bike safety, don't talk to strangers. Uh, he has a little TV in his chest. Uh, that allowed you actually him actually to play little things and uh, came to school my school every year and uh, I shouldn't call him a he you shouldn't anthropomorphize robots they hate that but uh, I just you know it's one of those machines that you know kids connected with and uh, around the country actually this company actually provided Officer Mac all over the place and taught thousands upon thousands of kids about bicycle safety and so forth. Sadly, we don't have his hat. He actually had an official Sunnyvale Police hat and badge. So, I love that. <laughs> I believe we still have a huge future for robots doing a lot of things for us that are useful in our lives. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and it, it's common. It, keeps, it takes a while, but it's a great field for young engineering students to be studying in. I used to go to Stanford Artificial Intelligence Center where I had a friend that worked, and I would see some robots doing different tasks, being trained to pick out cubes of a certain shape or whatever. And, just mesmerized me, you know, and I yeah. thought, wow, computers, this is like artificial intelligence. Well, it was kind of a low level of it, but uh, all, you know, we keep asking, are we going to build robots that are all of a sudden smarter than us and they take over? Well, we always have this idea we can turn them off. Well, today's biggest robot, the biggest example of intelligence we have is the internet. You used to ask a smart person a question, now who do you ask? Starts with G-O and it's not God. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so you ask your question, you get back all these incredible answers, you know, usually, usually you get better answers and quicker and get what you want than asking a human being. And so the part of the brain has now become, come about, and the internet was not designed to be that part of a brain. 
the internet was just you know designed to be connections between people and searches and because of its magnitude it has maybe an order number of magnitudes an order of magnitude the number of nodes that we have neurons in the brain all of a sudden it turns out to sort of be an intelligence well can you put that computer aside if you think about these early computers we saw that they made very few of that cost you know billions of today's dollars um, for the military those were very important steps to them and all of a sudden we've lost a lot of control we can't turn off our internet we can't turn off our smartphones we can't turn off our computer how would we live a life without any of those things you know for the next six months or something um, how would we you know cars without computers so all of a sudden technology we've just built it in to help us but we're dependent on it and eventually we're going to have it doing every task we can in the world so we can sit back and relax but now we're not needed as much as the technology so who's the master and who's the slave I always think but it's not like we designed these machines that would be intelligent enough to take over it like it happens by accident without us knowing what we're doing okay. we're going to head this way and This is going to be the section for computer music, graphics, and art. Uh, it's not installed yet, or I take you in there and brag because it's one of my sections. And this section is sort of, this is the, uh, following again, uh, the I.O. section. So it's mice, uh, I'm sorry, mouses, printers, displays. Uh, you can see a wonderful early version of a heads-up display uh, right there, that welder's mask looking thing. Uh, all sorts of things that you use to actually talk and get stuff in and out of computers with. And so this is a wonderful section with some crazy things. There's a mouse in there that weighs about seven pounds. Um, I don't know how you would possibly use it unless you had really buff arms. Um, so all sorts of strange things. Also about a half dozen foot mice. People had this concept that you would use your feet to move a mouse. I don't know why they would have thought that, but Good so on them for trying. So you can key, key more and use your feet to move the cursor around the screen. Yeah, I think that's a theory. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a very important exhibit because the biggest changes in computers throughout time are usually in the areas of input and output, the devices that really connect it to the, to the human being. Mm -hmm. um, did we pass up, Chris, the, um, where the Homebrew Computer Club? Sure. No, that's okay. actually here. Very quickly, this is Pong. This is the Pong prototype designed by Al Alcorn, who loaned it to us for this wonderful exhibit. Um, Probably the game most responsible for the explosion of arcades of the 1970s. Um, also the most pirated computer game ever. Uh, for I think for every official Pong Atari sold, there were about 15 Pongs that were unauthorized that were sold all around the world. This was built by wiring wires between chips that signals went up and down, up and down, no program. You didn't tell it a sequence of steps to follow. You had to program it to actually wind up putting white and black dots on the screen at certain places. You had to actually design it that way and it was very difficult in those days. I mean it would take maybe a half a band year at least to design a machine like this and a program it's maybe half a day. One of the early courses in introduction to computers in college you learn how to program things when like did you Pong. Start working at Atari? I didn't, I didn't work at Atari but I saw Pong in a bowling alley. I went home and said, oh my god, I have to have this. And my way was, I, I'm a good designer. I designed my own 28 little $1 chips on a board. I had Pong playing on my TV set at home. Snaked the cable in, figured out how to do it. And um, I, eventually Steve Jobs came back and he took my game down to Atari and he got a job. Atari was in Los Gatos, California, where I live now. Very proud of that. So I used to go in and visit at night. They had Steve working at night so he wouldn't be around other people. <laughs> and, it's good and bad, it's good and bad, it's good and bad. And uh, then he got us a job. I designed the first breakout game for Atari. Yeah. So I didn't really work there. They tried to hire me, but I said, never leave Hewlett Packard. I love my company, I'm loyal. Yeah. You built that in one weekend, didn't you? Um, breakout, four days. Four days and nights. It was a half million year job. I didn't think I could do it. And we stayed up all night, all day, all night long. We both got the sleeping sickness mononucleosis. Steve Jobs and I both got it doing that project. Delivered a working breakout game. And uh, it was one of the highlights of my life because I love games. I love things that young people do, the children do. It related to my interest in education. And um, it also you know, had a big impact in how I designed those game-like features into the early Apple computers, especially the Apple II because games were going to come into computers. Game equipment like knobs and paddles and buttons and sounds were going to be an important part of computers and I hope I had a little, um, a little uh, part in history in accelerating that. 
and then the computer gaming, as games became software, they took off to what we have today. Yeah. So we're going to go over to personal computers and she's going to talk about the homebrew age. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Okay. At um, our homebrew computer club, there were a lot of people that were low level, not executives in companies, 500 people every two weeks would meet in an auditorium and they all wanted to talk about the social revolution. We wanted to feel that we were leaders of something. We were the spirit. The big computer companies didn't realize that a computer in the home, a computer in your own possession was going to be so valuable, worth so much, so meaningful and uh, emotional. So they started saving their money and only a few of the people in the club, even after half a year, were able to afford their own little machines that were sold as kits of parts. You got a kit of parts and some instructions and you started bolting it together, soldering things like I did to my ham radio in sixth grade, and uh, you'd wind up with a little working device you could toggle switches up and down, ones and zeros. You could push buttons and those ones and zeros would go into a little area called memory. And um, it's very important. Now what we talked about these machines would be used for, they were going to empower people. We, were gonna, we young people that knew how to program the computers were going to become masters within our companies. We'd go into our company, put a computer on our desk, type in the company's financial data, and come out with the, the output as to what the company should do next, how it should use its money, and we were going to beat their million dollar computers and the, their high paid programmers just on our own. We were going to be able to type messages into one computer and a hundred people would read it an hour later and we could communicate in ways that had never been imagined before. Young children were going to be given problems to solve and their solutions would be judged and they would be told if it was right or wrong and their brains were going to be accelerated ten times more than normal brains. And we had all these great ideas that inspired us. And I said, I have technical skills and I want to donate my technical skills to this effort. So I built an Apple One computer um, by hand, all myself, all the hardware, did all the software. Bill Gates had written a basic. I said, basic, you need basic on a computer to make it really usable. So I wrote my own basic. You need enough memory. So I used the right type of memory that was affordable. And the Apple One was not exactly completely built like a hi-fi. You pull it out of the box and use it, but it totally gave away the formula that you should type on a small keyboard that's not here, a human keyboard like a typewriter, and see your answer on a video display that that was the way to make a computer affordable and other computers that we passed already followed in that model once they saw it. Now, I didn't design this computer to make a lot of money to start a company. I wanted to accelerate the world's advancement in this social revolution that it would cause, so I gave away my designs for free. I passed them out on Xerox sheets and gave them out to everybody at the club that wanted them and said, look, it's so easy, you can build your own. But eventually Steve Jobs came and said, why don't we build it for them and start a company called Apple and after Hewlett Packard turned me down five times on the idea. This device, the Apple One computer, was done very quick in a very quick time, just a few months. But the key to it was I already had a device, I had most of it already designed and built and working so I could talk to computers across the country. The early inspiration for today's internet was the ARPANET. It was an inspiration that gave us the ideas of connecting faraway computers together and I liked being at home and I could type on a little keyboard and on my, com my TV screen that wasn't playing Pong anymore, I could see a list of computers across the country and I could log on to MIT and then it would have things I could log in as a guest and I could run some programs that were available to guests and it was an amazing experience. I just said, why don't I put the computer, a microprocessor chip, these microprocessor chips were new. We didn't have very many transistors in those days. And why don't I put a little program that when you start up, it watches for you to type things like our calculators at Hewlett Packard. And that was really, um, really the formula to make a computer more like a calculator. Something a human being turns on and starts to use right away without having to go through the steps of building it, understanding the technology, knowing about even ones and zeros. And uh, the Apple II was really more a more thorough job of a beautiful computer, but this one wasn't designed to be a computer. It was designed to be a terminal, to talk to a computer in Boston, and I modified it to be a computer, and that was the Apple I. And I look at, if anyone looked down in those days and saw this few of chips, they were on a much smaller board, they would say, that's all you need to be able to type a computer program in and run a computer game. It would really be an amazing experience. 
So there aren't very many of these Apple Ones around. One just sold for what, $220,000? Yeah, one just sold at Christie's Auction House for extremely high price, and, but the um, bidder knew who, how, the seller knew how rare it was. He had bought it a few months before on eBay for 50000 So then he sold it at auction for two hundred. <laughs> He just, he just, he knows science and technology and what's worth what and how to, you know, that's his game. It'd be, it would have been nicer if it was an owner or a creator. <laughs> so we're going to head back to the exit theater, or the entrance theater, where we're all supposed to do an A. Let's point out a couple things on the way. Of course, the Apple II. Sure. Yeah, yeah, thank you. For about half as many chips, it did ten times as much as the Apple One. And no computer in the world expected, nobody expected color to come to computers. You know, my experience with video games just led me to try to come up with a great inspiration for building color and graphics and moving pieces and the ability to program games was one of my big desires in designing this machine. Okay? Okay. We'll head off this way. On this will be our section for mobile computing. So you can see Apollo right there. This guy's my personal favorite for mobile. This is Behemoth, or the big electronic human energized machine, only too heavy. Um, this is actually a guy named Steve Roberts, actually biked across the country. He could write articles, typing while he was driving, with his corded key set in the handlebars. I mean, he had a little heads up display so he could see what he was typing, and still keep his eyes on the road. Um, none of us can actually move this by actually pedaling it, because Steve Roberts is about six foot six, so none of us could read the pedals. But an amazing thing, this is 1990. So, you know, that, before the internet. Yeah, before the internet, and he had cell towers and all of this so that he could actually communicate and send his articles off via what was then still not yet the web, but the net at least. So, really impressive thing. There are about six computers in here. We're going to go this way. This is our networking section. One neat thing I want to point out here, this is a Minitel. Um, so French actually had thousands and thousands and thousands of these Minitels around. They actually replaced all the phone books. You could find them in cabs and everything. So this is one of their early, early uh, networking things. This also, a lot of people say that this prevented a full acceptance of the internet in France for at least five years because, you know, well, we have the Minitel network. We don't need the internet. Um, that turned out to be wrong. Um, we'll go over this way. And this is the exit theater. It's not a theater yet, but you can see a duck over here. <laughs> and this revolution exhibit opens January 10th and 11th, 110 and 111. Okay. So we have about five, ten minutes just as an open Q&A for either Steve or anybody else on the museum staff. We have John Haller, who is our CEO, as well as Chris Tashev as VP of Collections. Uh, Chris Garcia, who conducted the tour, and uh, a few of our docents as well. So we'll have this open section, and then after this we have another uh, uh, event, another uh, thing that we'd like to show you, which is a special treat. Uh, we have a Babbage engine. For those of you who haven't seen a Babbage engine, it's a Victorian era. It was designed to run on steam computer. There's only two in existence, and we have one of them. And Tim Robertson, who was going around, is one of the few people that actually know how to operate a Babbage crank. It's live. He's around the corner. So after this Q&A, Tim Robertson will actually demonstrate a Babbage crank working live. It's a 
Victorian era computer designed to run on steam that has a built-in printer. Well, let's open it up for Q&A. Steve, I had a question. It was, uh, those are some great stories, by the way, thanks. But um, I'm Mike Cassidy. Um, we read your column, read your columns all the time, every day. Thank you. You and my mother. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, when you were standing with the Apple One, it, I was just thinking about that auction that people were talking about last week and that huge price. I guess you were there. Well, the, what happened was on Sunday, I got a notice from Christie's. I, I had told somebody on the internet, oh, I'll be happy to sign it for whoever buys it. Uh -huh. They called, they got a hold of Christie's because I don't have the time. Yeah. Christie sends me an email. Oh, the seller is willing to pay your trip over here first class to be at the auction. What do you do? It's Sunday. I've got to leave today. i got to leave today for a Tuesday auction. I don't know what time the auction is. I don't know the seller. I don't know anything. Yeah. So I flew over, um, flew over with my daughter and pretty amazing when you're in this room about this size and the auctioneer is bringing up you know item number 37 item number 38 and da, 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 da. he's taking bids that are online on the internet in the back telling them what country a whole bunch of people with with cell phones talking to people that are phoning in bids people in the audience will sometimes just nod to make a bid my head itched I'm in the audience watching this thing the prices for the books are going between fifteen thousand and five hundred thousand dollars for each book they're selling yeah. I just sort of you know didn't want to didn't want to didn't want to raise my hand up and scratch my head well, you talked about, you know, <laughs> but the one. Apple II, yeah, the Apple One went for a lot of money because it's so rare. Uh -huh. There are museums that are running out. I think there's at least one museum. I can't remember if it was this one or one in Montana or something. That I think I bought one online for maybe forty thousand and gave it to them because uh -huh. it's hard for them to get. But, but what's that experience like? You you talked about why you why you uh, designed it and developed it in the first place, but to see it this many years later bring that sort of value. Um, it's the values because it's rare. There were maybe 200 made, maybe 150 really got sold in existence. Maybe some of those have disappeared. Museums that have them that want them, people that have them that want them, they're collectors. There are people like in Japan that if you have a document that anywhere on it, some little dumb thing, a little letter of praise and signed Apple, they'll bid on, they'll pay for it on eBay. At one, I'll stop, but is it so a close. source of pride or how do you feel about it? Sort of pride. Um, well, actually, I used to think, well, the Apple One wasn't designed as a computer, wasn't the great computer, but it showed the formula to the world. Uh -huh. But recently, I was at something, I think it was in Vienna, and they had a, a big poster. No, it was in Detroit, big poster. And there was an Apple One, me and Steve Jobs. And I looked at it and I said, that was when I realized if I saw, looking over somebody's shoulder in that era, that few of chips doing the whole job of a computer, I would have said, oh my God, that is just unbelievable. Just like these big, huge machines seem so unbelievable to us. Yeah. So it was, it was a very um, important step. Once the Apple I was, was designed and shown to people, even though it was passed around for free, it guaranteed that we would have things like iPhones today. It set the path. Thank you. Harry had a question. I wanted to ask, Waz, other than the, your own machines, is there a computer that has meant the most to you or which you admired most? Well, I explained today the data journal Nova, how important that was, even though I never used one in my life. Um, the IBM Comp 360 series models I admired so much for an architecture that was so expandable through different small machines up to big machines, the same program ran as it was. The CDC 6600 taught me so much about um, thinking differently in computer design. Um, <coughs> I don't know. I think every single cell phone I've ever had, every navigation system, every uh, computer I've had in my life meant a lot to me, except not generally not the PCs. I've had some and used them, but um, it's hard to say. You know, I, I like all the gadgets. I mean, to this day, I mean, I'm, I'm, you go outside in my car and I've got six different s setups on my dashboard and my windshield for like navigation systems and f smartphones, and sometimes I have them all talking to me to go to the same place. <laughs> it's just I love doing it, but I, I love doing it. You know, you, you just if you're if you're this you grow up this kind of way, you love these things and following the latest gadget and trying them out yourself and and using them. There's so much happening now. It's been the biggest um, we call it a revolution. Well, it's been so much change in, in one lifetime. And never before in the history of man, I don't think have we gone through so much change in the ways you do every single thing in life. And computers just change so fast you can't keep up anymore. You can just have a few select ones, try a few features out, but um, you can't. You could be a total expert back in the days of the Apple One and Two. Thank you. What type of stuff do you have at home? Documents, correspondence, hardware that, that you've kept personally? Uh, I tend not to keep my old stuff. 
I just, I'm more interested in playing with today and the newer gadgets and all that. I had a, a long set of documents that were all by hand. The design of the Apple One never went into any computer system of any sort. All done by hand, and I kept them in numbered envelopes. Heel Packard. I don't know why I thought this was going to be important. I'd never done that before in my life, but every document that touched my hand got kept. But then the lawyers got it for some lawsuit, and they got a box at Apple, and I never got it back. <laughs> and um, I have one document at home. It's a binder. The entire coding that went into an Apple II computer, including the basics that I wrote myself, was I couldn't afford, you know, 50 bucks a month or whatever it cost for a timeshare system to type my programs into. So I wrote my programs on paper by hand, and then I wrote the ones and zeros they would convert to by hand. Then I typed the ones and zeros into my own little machine to develop it. Never ever has an important machine like that ever been done totally by hand. Every bit of programming that you got on an Apple II, and never one bug has ever turned up. Um, I have that binder. That's, that's probably my most valuable artifact. I also have my original Apple I prototype where I hand wired all the chips, but the Apple II disappeared. I, I think the Smithsonian might have it, but I don't know how it got there. <laughs> Steve, thank you so much for joining okay. us. It was fantastic. Yeah. Well, Tim would uh, like to join us for the Babbage Bank. It's just around the corner. Tim Robinson is all set up um, and he's going to show a lot of demonstration. Oh, sure. One that's under here. Okay.